Welcome. Uh, I'm Merritt Jano, Dean of the School of International Public Affairs, and it's an enormous pleasure to welcome you here today. Uh, we're going to have an extraordinary afternoon of discussions and expert discussion on critical issues uh, facing global energy policy. This summit, the Global Columbia Energy Summit, has become, I think, already a premier gathering for energy leaders and policymakers and scholars to share their views and perspectives on the ever complex and challenging world uh, today uh, and those areas that implicate uh, energy. We have with us leading CEOs of energy companies, experts from our own university as well as other academic institutions, policymakers from around the world, legal and NGO leaders. It's really a remarkable gathering and uh, reflects the very big changes uh, that have taken place in the energy sector over the past few years. I think we can all agree that this is really a complex time in international global affairs. Uh, we're seeing tremendous changes occurring in the world today with impact not only in the energy sector, but the global economy and political uh, institutions as well. Whether it's the complex rise uh, of China and the increasingly dynamic economy represented by China and its importance to the global economy, uh, coupled with its active strategic uh, activities, uh, or uh, the tensions that we're seeing around international trade between the United States and its trading partners, uh, the changing role of technology in fostering innovation in the energy sector and other areas, um, I think a changing role of the United States in the world and new alliances being formed as a result at the national and at the regional multilateral level. These are all some of the changes happening in the world with implications for energy and which makes, I think, the School of International and Public Affairs an extraordinarily interesting place uh, for research uh, and engagement. We are the interdisciplinary hub of policy research and engagement at Columbia University and energy and the environment is a core part uh, of our mission. Uh, within our school, uh, we have more than 100 graduate students studying energy and the environment who will undertake careers in that sector uh, once they graduate. We have deep ties with the Earth Institute, with the School of Engineering, Law, Business, other parts of the university that are enga engaging different aspects of energy and the environment whether it's the geopolitics of energy to energy markets or technology or innovation to environmental impact and more, these are all areas of central focus and importance for the School of International and Public uh, Affairs. And we think about these areas with a mix of research and uh, engagement. Now, today actually marks the fifth year uh, of Jason Bordoff uh, being with us. Uh, and also of uh, really this birth of this very vital dynamic center on global energy policy at SEPA and at Columbia. Five years in the life of a university is a very short period of time, but really I think it, it's been an extraordinary five years of achievement uh, for the center. And the center in, in these course of the five years have not only grown its affiliated faculty, but also the faculty across the university uh, that have come to see it as a vital center of activity and engagement. I particularly want to recognize and applaud Jason Bordoff, the center's founding director, uh, for his leadership and for the remarkable team that he has assembled to create such a dynamic center. It's really done an amazing job and it's ever creative in thinking about how to engage key regions of the world, key research areas, uh, convene thought leaders from multiple sectors, find new ways of reaching the public through podcasts, which I invite you to follow if you are not already, uh, bring women uh, into uh, the area of research and applaud their leadership, um, bring leaders from around the world with very diverse viewpoints. 
So we're very uh, admiring of the work of the center, and I thank all of you here who have come to be its vital supporters and participants. Um, I'm very much looking forward to today's discussion and learning the insights from our panelists. We'll have two keynote conversations with the current U.S. Deputy Secretary of Energy, as well as with the Executive Director of the International Energy Agency. So thank you both very, very much uh, for being with us. Thank you all today. It's now my pleasure to introduce Jason Bordoff, Founding Director of the Center on Global Energy Policy. Congratulations, Jason. Thank you. <clears throat> thanks very much, uh, Merritt, and <clears throat> thanks to all of you for being here today. Um, today is a really special day for, for me and for Columbia University, as you heard almost exactly five years ago today, five years ago <clears throat> this coming Tuesday, actually, we came together in the same majestic rotunda, low library, to uh, announce the creation of a new kind of research institution a policy research center housed at one of the world's great research universities to bring the insights from some of the best academic work being done in the world to bear across many different disciplines on helping better understand the rapidly changing global energy mix and understand some of the world's most pressing energy problems. <clears throat> we were joined that day by some people who are here uh, today. You'll hear from them in a minute, but also at that time by then Mayor Michael Bloomberg. I was rereading uh, a few days ago what he said then. I'm gonna, standing at this lectern, just give you one quote. Mayor Bloomberg said, there's no magic bullet that will solve our energy challenges. <clears throat> and I've always believed that rigorous analysis is key to understanding fundamental trade-offs. Today, public dialogue over the future of energy is badly skewed toward the extremes, and that does little to advance the public interest. We have to get serious about facing the competing security, economic, and environmental trade-offs that a realistic, forward-thinking energy policy requires. Those words are more apposite today than when he said them, and producing that sort of fact-based, actionable research for the last five years has been at the core of the Center on Global Energy Policy's mission. There's no more important issue to the global economy, to geopolitics and national security, to the environment than energy, and yet perhaps no other issue where the dialogue we have about it, the debate we have about it, is both more uncertain and more rapidly changing, and at the same time where our dialogue is so dominated by hyperbole, misinformation, polarization, and rhetoric. And so I'm immensely proud of what we've achieved at the Center on Global Energy Policy in five short years uh, to try to uh, be part of addressing those issues, emerging as one of the world's leading energy research centers, producing timely and relevant analysis, offering a unique convening platform for private conversations, for public events like the one today, and very importantly to our mission at a great university, training the next generation of leaders. <clears throat> There are too many highlights of the past year to list them all. I'm not going to do that. From hiring world-class talent, we just uh, announced the addition to our team yesterday of uh, Dave Banks, who left the White House uh, last month after serving as special assistant to the president. You'll hear from him later today. Uh, assembling a fantastic team of people to work with the faculty, the tenured faculty at Columbia University. Publication of influential books and research papers, convenings we put together all over the world, student programs, professional programs, and much more. Uh, earlier this year, for example, we published two new books in our book series through Columbia University Press, uh, one that took a dispassionate look at what the evidence tells us about a rather polarized and controversial issue of fracking and the other about the uh, use of sanctions and unintended consequences from them. And this complements dozens of reports, commentaries, articles, testimony, op-eds, and more. Let me also just mention three initiatives and programs that we have started just in the last um, <clears throat> year or two. First, as I, I hope you're all regular listeners to Columbia Energy Exchange, our weekly podcast program, 30-minute conversations with world energy leaders, including some who are in this room today. If not, please check it out. Second, um, Amy Jaffe is well known to people in the energy world. She and Maria Jelescu, uh, have are now co-chairing the steering committee for the Women in Energy program that we built two years ago at Columbia. And that is going to enjoy 
increased uh, commitment from us and growth moving forward to support women who are planning to graduate and then pursue careers in the energy sector. <clears throat> and then third, one of the most exciting initiatives we launched uh, in the last year has been the new Columbia Energy Journalism Initiative, sort of a boot camp for young journalists who are uh, on the energy beat to deepen their understanding of a full range of energy and environmental issues. We'll host our second class of journalists for a week-long program with about 20 journalists from all over the world this summer. This exciting growth and all we've been able to achieve in five years has uh, been possible because of uh, a team effort, the huge team that's too long to, to name, but I do just want to acknowledge Merritt Jane our dean, who you heard from a minute ago, and our president, Lee Bollinger, and our provost, John Coatsworth. For me, it's hard to imagine an institution uh, better than Columbia with which to build a center like this, and SIPA, the School of International Public Affairs, even more so because of its global reach and perspective, its commitment to real-world impact, and its depth across such a broad range of issues from law and economics to international relations, science, engineering, business, which you need all of those things to bring together to understand the very multidisciplinary issues around energy policy. I want to thank the members of our advisory board, many of whom are here with us today in this room. I hope you'll uh, <clears throat> follow the work we do through our website, on social media, on our distribution list. Um, I'm really proud of what the center's achieved in five years and, and tremendously excited about what's to come in the next five. So first, before we get started, let me uh, just mention a few brief ground rules. Uh, first, please be respectful of our speaker. Silence your cell phones and uh, step outside if you need to have a side conversation. If you would like to pose questions to the speakers, uh, you have two options. You can do so via Twitter, at Columbia U Energy, using the hashtag CGEP events, as with all of our events. Or you can text your questions to 646-419-3399. You don't need to remember that. It's in the brochure that was on your seat. And, uh, and those questions will make their way to the moderator. With that, let me turn to our program. Uh, among the people who were here on that day five years ago when we launched the center are uh, the two people in our first keynote conversation of the day, Ryan Lance and Dan Jurgen. So it's especially meaningful to have both of them back with us here today. Dan, of course, needs no introduction at an energy conference. Perhaps no one has been more influential and highly regarded in the energy sector for decades than Dan, winner of the Pulitzer Prize for the Prize, founder of Cambridge Energy Research Associates, currently vice chair at IHS Market, and most importantly, one of the friends and mentors who has been most important uh, in my life and to the life of the Center on Global Energy Policy. So welcome back to Columbia, Dan. Uh, and as I mentioned, along with Mayor Bloomberg and the National Security Advisor at the time, our other keynote speaker at our first ever uh, Global Energy Summit was Ryan Lance, the CEO of Conoco. <clears throat> Few companies have played as central a role to the revolution we've seen in U.S. energy production as Conoco, not to mention operate in such important energy regions around the world, from the Middle East to China to South America. Uh, I'm not going to say more to introduce Ryan because Dan's going to say a few words of introduction, but uh, it really was a privilege to have you with us five years ago, and I'm really uh, honored that you were willing to take the time to travel to New York to be with us on our fifth anniversary Global Energy Summit. So with that, let me ask Dan and Ryan to please come to the stage, and I'll turn it over to Dan Jurgen. Thank you. Well, hello, everybody. Um, Ryan, welcome back. Thank you. After five Thank years. You. Yep. Uh, Jason uh, said a few words about uh, the center. I have to say, as somebody who has been was here five years ago and has seen it develop, it's uh, really, I've seen its worldwide impact, its convening power, the quality of its research. Great credit to uh, SIPA, to Dean Jano, uh, which is, of course, the home of the center, for the support of the center, and it's flourished under the SIPA banner, and it's really had a, a, a global footprint and uh, continues to uh, grow and develop. And so I just have to say personally, it's been great to be an advisory board member. And uh, Ryan, so we're back here. Uh, Ryan, of course, is one of the leaders in the global oil and gas industry. Uh, I was thinking, Ryan, if this was not the fifth anniversary, but at the 10th anniversary, the US would have been producing at that point 5 million barrels a day. Uh, the day we were here five years ago, it produced about 7.2 million barrels a day, and today uh, it's producing about 10.4 million barrels a day. So uh, 
that's a lot of growth. Uh, how do you see that growth? Yeah, so uh, thank you, thank you, Dan. And Jason, thank you as well. Uh, my congratulations, Dean and, and Jason, to uh, a wonderful five years. been pretty action-packed over the last five years, and I can't imagine how fast it will evolve over the next five. So we're, for, we're thankful for uh, the Institute and thankful for Columbia for, uh, for hosting it. You've done a, done a remarkable job. Yeah, uh, Dan, so it's, uh, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, five years ago, you had a back cast and uh, said, where, if you were Van Winkle yourself and said, where, I'm going to wake up five years from now, would you have ever imagined you'd be in a place you are today? And I don't think uh, many people back five years ago would have done that, especially with the revolution and what's going on you now in North America and the United States in particular with this shell revolution. As you said, uh, this year now the prices have gone through a pretty dramatic downturn. And, and the way I put that in perspective for people to think about is imagine losing 70% of your revenue over six months' time as a business. That's what our industry went through in 2014 into 2015 as this downturn took hold. Now as things have recovered, technology innovation has taken hold, the shell revolution is alive and well, and this year probably the growth in terms of total liquids will be on the order of 1.6 million barrels per day. So if you compare December of last year to what we project December of this year to be, that total liquids production just in the United States will grow at 1.6 million barrels a day, plus or minus a little bit. That's remarkable. So what's been, I mean, as you said, lost 70% of your revenues. Uh, obviously, things have bounced back. Uh, what's uh, generated this? What's happened in terms of the technology and the learning to enable this? And that's what's really been remarkable about the industry. So we're, we've been known, or the mantra for the oil and gas industry is a low-tech industry. You get the picture of the rig, you get the people on the, on the rig floor throwing a chain around and all that. Well, that's as far from the truth today as it's ever, ever been at all. And so now we're drilling wells that will start from this spot here, go two miles underground at uh, you know, 10, 20,000 feet underground and, and exploit some of the resource from a very small footprint. So some of that technology today, this intersection of horizontal drilling, uh, hydraulic fracturing that is unlocking uh, resources out of rock that is as hard as this stage that we're sitting on today. And that's truly been remarkable, and, and it hasn't stopped, and it's going forward with there. When you think about data analytics, artificial intelligence, machine learning, you know, our industry, like many industries around the world, are starting to just scratch the surface there as well. So d despite the progress we've made over the last five years, we ought to see that move exponentially again over the next five and 10 years, which is what I think makes the business so exciting. You know, Jason uh, mentioned that obviously there's controversy. We're in New York State uh, ab about this. Uh, you know the technology very well. What is it that people don't understand about the technology in terms of the environmental debate about? Well, I think it's, uh, you know, the, the, there is a, the energy conundrum in the world today is about how do you get affordable, reliable, cheap energy to all four corners of the world, yet understand we have to do that sustainably. And we have to do that with the environment in mind. We have to do it with safety in mind. We have to do it with uh, both personal and process safety in mind as we think about that. So the operating integrity of our business is, is pretty important. I think what people don't really appreciate is, is how much the growth and development in the United States has gone on, how much we've added to the global supply to keep you know, energy cheap for uh, really the whole globe and, and in particular for North America and the United States. And we've been able to do that against the backdrop of declining emissions, declining methane emissions, declining CO2 emissions. We're uh, getting better at our water footprint where we're recycling much of our water that we use in the process that we're doing. And just the actual footprint at the surface has reduced dramatically as we're able to institute some of this long reach horizontal drilling technology. So it is a much more sustainable business today than it was five, 10, 15 years ago, and it will continue to get more sustainable as we go in the future. Well, if you, I mean, it is striking. If you put it in geopolitical context, the U.S. has gone from importing 60 percent of its oil to importing about 20 percent, and in fact, the U.S. has become an exporter as well. Yeah, I think that was, uh, that was a seminal moment in our industry because we, we looked at it five, six, seven years ago. We saw what this unconventional revolution was doing in the United States, and the one thing that would get in the way of making us realize our full potential was the ban on export crudes from, the, from North America. So that was a huge event in our industry, was to eliminate the ban, let the free market work, and let, uh, let us start supplying 
affordable, reliable, cheap energy to all those four corners of the world. And in fact, that's what's happening today. Two million barrels a day of exports, and our imports have dropped dramatically. And what's that mean? That means cheaper fuel prices at the pump, cheaper electricity for your home to, uh, to heat and cool your homes around the United States. So I think that's added a lot of economic growth to, uh, to the GDP sitting in the United States today. So we're having a huge impact. Uh, but that kind of growth, if it continues, are, what kind of constraints in terms of people, pipelines, equipment? Yeah, I think uh, the, the next challenge for our industry will be some of the regulatory environment, and it will be the infrastructure. It will be being able to move the energy generally from the center part of the United States out to the coastal part where it's needed. And, uh, and dare say heresy, it probably is getting natural gas uh, ultimately, you would hope, past New York up into the northeast part of the country where people can start getting off fuel, burning fuel oil and getting them burning a more sustainable product called natural gas. It has a lower carbon footprint than what they're burning today. And I think that's the restrictions that we place in terms today. It's getting that infrastructure permitted, built, and in place to move the products around the United States to the, to the demand centers and then to the coast to be exported out to the rest of the world. Is uh, one state, maybe, what about Texas? I mean, a lot of growth in Texas and... No, there is. So Texas is going through remarkable growth. A lot of the geology is conducive to a lot of uh, what you're seeing today. It started in the Eagleford in the upper Texas Gulf Coast and now has moved into a big way into the Permian Basin where there's a tremendous amount of resource and a tremendous amount of growth that will occur over the next five years. And part of, the, part of the issues will be getting the crude oil out, getting it to the market, getting it to the export channels. It'll be dealing with the associated gas, getting gas pipelines um, out of there into the uh, demand centers around the United States, into the export facilities, and then getting it uh, to, the, to the global community. That's a challenge specific to Texas today because there's a tremendous amount of growth going on in the Permian Basin because this technology is just unlocking a tremendous amount of resource. So we're here in New York, of course, the center of the financial industry, and uh, different kinds of constraints, uh, different type of demands from shareholders uh, in terms of capital discipline, uh, which maybe wasn't there before the price collapsed. How does that affect growth expectations? How does it affect how people run companies? Yeah, I think the, uh, this whole revolution, the resource-rich constraint, I think our, our belief, and we, we sat back about five years ago, looked at our company, looked at our plans, looked at our portfolio. We saw what was happening in the unconventional space. We saw the growth coming, and again, back this is at $100 oil when we're making some of these decisions, is that when you look over the, the last 15, 20 years in the E&P, the exploration and production side of the business, it wasn't a very profitable business for investors. We typically spend 100% of the cash flow that we have or more and put it back into the ground to further and develop and grow our production. And some of the returns weren't meeting the hurdles. Certainly the S&P 500 and some of the other investment choices and options that shareholders have today. When we looked out ahead, we saw a, an abundance of resource coming in the world. We saw potentially mid-cycle prices moving down. We saw a lot more volatility coming in the business today because this unconventional production that we're getting out of the U.S., you can bring it on pretty fast, you can throttle it back pretty fast. So we're seeing a declining mid-cycle, we're seeing lots of more volatility, shorter time between peaks and valleys, and you have to change your portfolio to deal with that. And you have to deal with the issue that your returns aren't good enough. So you have to start executing capital discipline, you have to doing the best of the opportunities that you have in your portfolio, and more importantly, you got to test it against the low side cycle and the price deck. So will, will what you're doing work in a $40, $50 world as well as in a $70 or an $80 world? Because we think we're going to see that kind of volatility in our business. And as a company, we decided we didn't want to chase that volatility, add a bunch of people and rigs and, and process as you go up only to have to cut it down on the downside maybe one or two years later. So we've tried to build a company that works through the cycle with a portfolio that can manage at $40 and $50 as easily as we can at 60 and 70 And I think that's starting to manifest itself in higher returns. And I think it's starting to get noticed a bit in terms of the, the market and the shareholders. And, and, and being demanded of other companies. Yeah. I think it will. So the, the, it was a lonely place when we talked about this kind of a value proposition a returns focused, work through the cycles uh, kind of value proposition, but now more, more companies are coming to that space 
just because they see it's a well-supplied world. Yes, demand is growing, but the supply is growing as well. So you have to be dealing. How do you deal fundamentally with a volatile uh, price deck that you have to, uh, you know, again, we're, we're not price makers, we're price takers. We take from the market and we have to deal with that volatility. So you have came up with this term, sustainable capital? We did. I think the important thing in the E&P business and the business that we're in is what is your sustaining capital and consequently, more importantly, your sustaining price. And what I mean by that is how much money do you have to invest into your portfolio to, at a minimum, hold your production flat? So again, we're a declining resource. Our na it's a natural decline. We always have to invest money to grow our production, grow our cash flows. But the real critical number is how much capital do you have to invest in your business to at least hold it flat? And then what price does it take to fund that kind of a capital program and fund your dividend or your returns to your shareholders? And if you can drive the price at which you get enough cash flow coming into the company to afford that capital program and your shareholder distribution, you want to drive that price down as low as you can. And today in our company, we've driven that down to $40 a barrel. So what that means is at $40 a barrel, I have enough cash coming into the company to afford a capital program that will at least keep me flat for a long, long period of time, and it will fund my dividend to my shareholders. And that's an important thing to do in a cyclic commodity business where the, where the volatility is there and the cycles are getting shorter. So um, in one sense, uh, you all are somewhat con uh, contrarian in the sense that I think people in this room, some have written and talked about this uh, obsession with the Permian Basin, uh, uh, Permania, I think it's been dubbed, uh, but uh, you don't seem to be quite caught up in that. You're, you're looking at other places. Well, you know, we believe in a global diverse portfolio. So, our, you know, we, we operate in 17 countries around the world. We have a large operation in Alaska, Canada, U.S. lower 48. We're operating in Asia. We have a business in Europe. We have a business in the Middle East. So we do believe in a balanced sort of global diverse portfolio. For a company of our size, we also have a large Permian position as well. And I think there's people in this room here today from my business that even have uh, bigger Permian positions that are important in their portfolio. And it's going to be a huge resource, an important basin for decades to come. Um, but, you know, it's, it's quite expensive to do business today. We're getting inflationary forces in the basin. I talked about the infrastructure constraints to evacuate the product we have from the basin. Now, those things will work through. There will be capital that will be attracted there to deal with those issues, so it's not like it's going to become a trapped resource. But it's a tremendous, tremendous resource for, for our country. But as we sit with our company today, we do believe in a global diverse portfolio, and I think it's benefited our company quite so well. So what are the areas that... So, so Alaska today, about you know, 12, 13 percent of our production. Canada, uh, both in the unconventional and in the heavy oil. U.S. is a big part of our company. It's about 40 percent of our company. We're active in all the unconventional plays. We're active in the Permian. We're active in the Eagleford, Niobrara, the Bakken, names you might uh, hear in, in our business. Uh, we have a big business in Europe, both in the U.K. sector and the Norwegian sector. And they have a large business in Asia. Uh, we've been in China since it opened up in the 70s. We've been in Malaysia, Indonesia, Australia, and we, uh, we have production coming out of the Middle East. So we're pretty balanced across the, across right. the United and, uh, across and, the globe. And how do you see the LNG business? You know, I think uh, we have a similar view to a lot of people on the LNG side. It's, it's an oversupplied market today. So it ends up, it's a buyer's market. So the buyers are being able to demand lots of terms and conditions from the suppliers because there was a lot of projects that were built over the last decade that have now come on. But the demand is growing, primarily in the Asian side, China in particular, India growing as well. So we see, uh, we see that uh, demand catching up with the oversupply and eliminating that differential sometime in the next decade, probably 2022, 23, 24. So there will be more investment needed in green-filled LNG projects both here in the United States and around the world in order to meet that growing demand over time. But the projects do take quite a bit of time to execute. So the cycles in the LNG business are still quite wide. So we go through valleys and peaks and troughs, and those are probably six, seven, eight years in terms of uh, time frame. Will you be oversupplied for a period? Uh, then uh, no, no projects will get built. Demand will catch up. There's uh, the price will have to price has to rise in order to incentivize those projects to be built. And we see that cycle coming again probably early in the next decade. Right. So uh, I'd like to ask you about two emotive words, 
regulation and deregulation. <laughs> and they're both used in very broad senses as though the whole world is changing. Can you kind of parse it for us? And actually, in your business, what's happening in regulation? And when we talk about deregulation, what's being deregulated? What's being not regulated additionally? And just how to think about it? Yeah, so I, I put... I put the regulation, deregulation, this, this argument, this discussion that we're having as a, as a country now, and I, I put it kind of into three buckets. And the first bucket I'll tell you is the, um, what the industry is doing. You know, we are working hard to self-regulate ourselves. We're not about lowering the floor. We're actually about raising the floor. We understand that it's our license to operate in the world, and we have to do that sustainably. We work under local, state, federal regulations, global regulations, as well. So this isn't an industry that's trying to eliminate all the regulations. So we are about policing our own. We do that through API, through the associations that we're members of, and try to get everybody to follow all the recommended practices that we think are the best for our industry. So it is about raising that floor. Second, I think it does have to be a balance between cost and, and the benefit. We have to look at regulations and say, are they worth it? Let me give you an example here. So at the end of the last administration, and this is the way we've gotten to Washington, D.C., there were over 190 new regulations proclamated on our industry alone in the last 10 days of the prior administration. And that's because they could... 190. 190. And that's because they could through executive order. So a lot of what you're seeing today is an unwinding of a lot of those that uh, didn't make a lot of sense and were unnecessary burdens on business, and let me give you an example for the people who doubt what I'm talking about. So I was having conversations with the EPA, and we were talking about methane regulations. And uh, we actually, as an industry, were agreeing to regulating methane emissions on new facilities going forward. The question became, what about existing facilities? And there's thousands of existing facilities across our country, and it would have been impossible for the EPA to regulate that in a cost-benefit way that made sense. We agreed to do that voluntarily. We agreed to implement a lot of those regulations voluntarily as industry, um, whether it's FLIR cameras checking for volatile or fugitive emissions off pipelines, whether it was tank hatches being open. And uh, at the end of the day, they said, no, we're not going to go do that, even though industry was ready to and submit the third-party validation of that. So it's just an example of overreach by the regulatory side that really, at the end of the day, wasn't going to achieve the objective that they wanted to achieve. You could actually get there through a voluntary program much quicker, much cheaper, and actually get more done out of that program. So that's the second area. Third area, I would just say, is durability. That concerns us with the way that we're making policy, the way we're running regulations right now, uh, we're concerned about the durability. If you can whipsaw them that fast between administrations, that doesn't make a lot of sense for business as we go forward. So those are the three areas I would talk about regulation that we're trying to impact and the conversations we're trying to have with, uh, with the regulators. And so what do you see ahead? I mean, we have... Well, unfortunately, I don't know if we're going to get a lot of uh, hope in dealing with those kinds of the kinds of issues. I think uh, we do see uh, uh, we do see some progress. I think uh, the question for us is going to be on the durability. Can we, depending on what whoever what administrations in the White House next or in or who's controlling Congress, it's just important for business. We're making very long-term decisions. We make investments, and we don't get cash flow for three, four, five, and in some cases, ten years. So the stability, predictability, and durability is really an important concept for business in general, but in particular for our business. So out of that 190, are most of them still in effect? Or? Uh, most of them have been unwound right. over so, the course of the last two years. Right. So uh, you mentioned long-term investing. I've got to ask you, uh, a well-known uh, institutional investor sent out a letter uh, saying that companies... Uh, Managements need to think about long term when they invest rather than short term. Uh, do you think about long term or short term? What do you? Yeah, absolutely. And what's your reaction? I, yeah, well, I got my letter. Um, it went out to a thousand CEOs. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, you know, I kid with Dan a little bit on, on this particular point. I think our industry is the uh, poster child for long termism. I mean, I just described we're making investments today that we may not see cash flow for five or 10 years from today. So we make very long-term investments. We're very active in the communities that we operate in. 
lot of our philanthropic dollars and all our, 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 you know, our donations, what we talk to to make sure we're sustainable in the communities. We like to be involved. Our people live in the communities where they, where they work. And so we're very active in, 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 in that kind of realm. You look at uh, socially, we pay, our industry pays quite well. You can be a, a blue collar, high school educated individual and earn a six figure income and probably have a 401k and a retirement plan in our business today. So when you think about sort of that full sustainability of this business from employees to the communities that we work in to the long term investments that, that we're making, I think we check all of Mr. Fink's boxes. So you've given the name away, yes. Uh, there are several questions here about climate change, the oil and gas industry, ConocoPhillips. Uh, maybe start with uh, the other form of shareholder demands, not in terms of uh, capital discipline, but uh, on uh, climate issues. How do, you, how do you see that and experience that? Yeah, I think the, uh, what we call the ESG issues, the environmental, social, and governance issues, are not going away. I don't know where they'll be 10 years from now, but there'll be certainly more, uh, more conversations about that as we, as we go forward in time. And I think, again, it's about delivering affordable, cheap energy to all four corners of the world, but doing that sustainably. And I think as a company, we've engaged in this conversation for a long time. We were actually part of the Waxman-Markey bill for cap and trade you know, 15 years ago. We were part of trying to do that. So we understand the impact that it has and, and how we need to think about it as a company. So we think about how do we reduce our emissions. We're one of the few ENP companies that have set an emissions target. So our, our commitment to our shareholders and to, to the public is to reduce our greenhouse gas intensity over the next uh, you know, 20, 30 years um, you know, substantially. So we understand we've got to be doing that. We understand we have to be sustainable. We're addressing water issues, making sure that we can clean up the water, reuse the water that we use, and pump it down the well for the, uh, for the hydraulic fracture stimulations that are leading this renaissance. So we understand that we have to do that sustain. We're trying to lead and participate in that conversation as a company and recognize that it's important, not only to shareholders, not only to our employees, to me, but also to the, uh, the general public at, at large. Right. Uh, on the water recycling, a question, since you mentioned it came up, um, what about um, how much water gets recycled? A couple of people asked that. Well, it's, uh, it's quite a lot. I think in the, in the Permian Basin today, for every barrel of oil that's produced, there's four barrels of water that's produced. So it is about recycling that water, reusing the water, uh, properly disposing of the water in our business. So uh, it, is very, it is a very important thing to be able to put the technologies in place to clean it up, reuse what we produce. And again, we don't, we don't take out of uh, you know, drinkable um, aquifers. We're taking saline water deep, deep in the earth out, trying to figure out how to use that in our operations. We don't, we don't touch drinking aquifers that are down 5,000 feet in, into the ground. We're talking about water that we're taking out very, very deep in the ground. There are also a couple of questions here about the great slowdown in the offshore and whether ConocoPhillips intends to be active in the offshore, in the deep water. Well, we made a, again, this goes back to the strategic decisions we made as a company when we looked at our portfolio. We looked at the, the advances that we were making onshore in this unconventional revolution, and we made a decision as a company not to pursue the deep water, go, the, the deep water exploration and, and all that business. We felt like it wasn't going to be competitive. It wasn't going to compete for capital. Um, we think the world will need that as a supply source going forward to meet the growing demand in the business. It just wasn't going to compete for capital inside our company. So today we have no plans to, uh, to go back into that deep water province. We just don't think it will be competitive with the rest of our portfolio. Of course, what happens in the United States is not in a vacuum. Uh, your thoughts about OPEC, non-OPEC, your thoughts about geopolitical risk today? Well, I think it, you know, we just, you read the paper and you see a, you know, missile strike in Syria, you see what's going on, Venezuela, you know, certainly uh, not going well today. Um, we have production in Libya, it's been uh, coming back uh, following the, the overthrow of Colonel Gaddafi, but it's been a slow, kind you of a do, slow you do, recovery. You do, have, you do have production? Yeah, we have about 50,000 barrels a day of production today in Libya, so we're, uh, we're a part of that. Uh, the, the regrowth and the redevelopment of what's happening in Libya. So I would say, you know, I, I think it's a pretty safe world today. I don't think there's any, you know, big, big significant existential threats out there, but you have to monitor that pretty closely. It doesn't take a lot to, uh, to jumble. And I would call the supply and demand balance 
very thinly balanced in the world today. Even though it's a well-supplied world, it doesn't take much on the demand side. If we reduce demand a little bit, prices can fall down pretty rapidly. We increase supply, prices can fall down rapidly. If we decrease supply due to some geopolitical events, you can watch prices rise pretty rapidly as well. And that, again, just goes to this volatility that we're that we think is in the business today. So let me ask you about another kind of force that's working on the industry. New technologies, uh, big data, uh, artificial intelligence, blockchain. I mean, where do those fit in the picture? Well, that's our, that's our next step function change in the business. You know, we can't drill a well in zero days, but we're getting pretty darn close. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the technology, when you think about uh, our operators out in the field with their handheld mobile device being able to interrogate all the data that they have to make decisions on how they do their job on a daily basis. Think about how we're analyzing data today. You think about blockchain, uh, data analytics, artificial intelligence, machine learning. Our industry, just like many other industries out there, are at the are kind of at the front front end of all that stuff. And I think that's just going to be another revolution that continues to lower the cost of supply, continue to lower the cost of doing business, and being able to make our industry much more resilient. So what does that mean in terms of the next generation, the people coming into the industry, what kind of people you're looking for, and are they there? Yeah, I think uh, STEM is still important, or STEM graduates are still very important for our industry. And uh, I think we need to have uh, engineers, geologists, geophysicists, we need to be training them. Um, but they need to be incredibly data analytics and computer literate today because an engineer coming out, I was just meeting with my alma mater yesterday, talking about, you know, talking to the dean, saying, what do you think need to be thinking about for these next generation of engineers and geophysicists? And they really need to have these data analytics skills. They need to understand machine learning. They need to understand artificial intelligence, robotics, and some of these things that are coming down. It's going to put a big challenge on our educational institutions to start delivering these people because we're having to train them immediately with these kinds of skills in order to be effective in their, in their job today. And so that will change change the profile of the industry in terms of production, output, how it does things? Oh, absolutely. Again, I, again, I think it's lowering the cost of supply. It's making the resource more, more uh, the abundant resource more affordable, more competitive on the, on the global scale. And it won't just be the unconventionals. It will eventually, it will go to the deep water. It will go to all four, you know, all different countries and all different areas around that uh, produce oil and gas. All right. So, Ryan, let me thank you very much for coming back after five years. The world does change, and your perspectives and insights are very much appreciated. So thank you indeed. Thank you, Dan. Yeah.